Okay, we are ready. So in accordance with uh, OMA and obviously during uh, the pandemic, we are hosting um, the March 2022 Commission on Social Innovation meeting uh, via uh, Facebook Live. So we are, all members uh, are remote today. Um, so we will get started uh, in calling uh, to order this meeting. Um, Irene, can I please help, uh, if you could please help me um, call attendance so that we can establish quorum. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner De Laurentiis. Commissioner Flores. Commissioner Mails. Present. Thank you. Commissioner Siskillen. Present, good afternoon. Commissioner Alsbury. Commissioner Haddon. Commissioner Guajardo. Commissioner Thomas. Commissioner She's Freeman. She's here, but I believe um, we couldn't hear her. No. Oh, hi, can you hear me now? Yes, Sorry. thank you. And if you can also mark um, Commissioner slash Alderwoman uh, Haddon is also present. Thank you. Sorry not to unmute, yeah, present. Thank you. Commissioner Aglipay. Commissioner Rice. Present. Thank you. Commissioner Alston. Present. Thank you. Commissioner Jonan. Present. Commissioner Malone. Present. Commissioner Anderson. Commissioner Brutus. Commissioner Cooley. Present. Thank you. Commissioner Raymer. Present. Commissioner Espinosa. Commissioner Dubow. Pre I'm sorry, present. I couldn't, yeah, I'm here. Hello, everybody. Commissioner Dubow is present too. Good to see everybody. Thank you. Commissioner Schleiser. Commissioner Caliento. Present. We have the Axel Fischel Criticals. Thank Here. you. We have our Vice Chair, Mark Lane. Present. Thank you. And then we have our Commission Chair, Alma, Commissioner Almanaya. Present. And I do see um, Commissioner Guajardo is just joining us right now, so please take note of that. And then, Madam Chair, I don't know if that's Christy De Laurentiis's phone. Is that Christy on the KDL? It is. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Christy, for joining us. We'll make sure we note that. Commissioner Freeman is also on the call. Thank you, noted. And I see that I believe Commissioner Brutus just joined as well. Okay, oh, Anna Guajardo is here. Yes, thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, Commissioner Guajardo, Commissioner Brutus for joining us. So we do have quorum today. Um, I believe we've had, uh, we've noted uh, everybody who's present. Um, we will begin with public testimony. Um, to my knowledge, uh, Irene, there was no public testimony submitted. Is this still accurate? That's correct. Okay, perfect, thank you. 
Um, so the next uh, item on the agenda is the approval of the minutes for January and February. Um, uh, so I will entertain a motion to approve um, and then a seconder, please. So moved, Howard Mills. Thank you, Commissioner Seconded. Mills. Seconded. And then we'll have a second from, I didn't catch that. Was that Commissioner Haddon? Thank you. Yes. <laughs> Great. Um, were there any corrections to the minutes from the last two meetings? Did everybody receive them and was able to see them? Yes. Okay, great. Um, so if there was no corrections now, we um, all of those uh, for approval signify by saying aye. 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 All aye. those opposed? The ayes have it. Thank you, everyone. Great. So we will um, go up uh, and now discuss any updates uh, from uh, the chair and vice chair. I personally don't have any updates. Um, as you all know, we're still in the county working through ARPA funding um, and trying to, uh, you know, solidify what exactly are the programs that we're going to be funding as a government entity. Just a reminder, Cook County will be receiving $1 billion in funding. So there have been some exciting um, uh, advances, uh, particularly a work around uh, investment in our health system and our behavioral health. Um, also this week, there were some trainings and info sessions for uh, $50 million that will be going to gun violence prevention uh, initiatives. So there's definitely a lot happening uh, and uh, I'd be more than happy at the next meeting uh, once things get a little bit more solidified to come back to this uh, commission to report back on some of those really exciting projects. Uh, Vice Chair Lane, were, was there anything on your end um, that you'd like to uh, update um, the commission on? A uh, couple of things along the way, but my suggestion is uh, given the importance of the testimony we're about to hear, we move into that meet, if that's okay with you, Madam Chair. Thank you, and I just uh, want to welcome uh, Kathleen, uh, Commissioner Clianto, for joining us. This is her first meeting. We're excited to have her uh, on board uh, the commission. Uh, we're excited to, uh, you know, for you to bring your expertise, your knowledge um, uh, to the commission. Thank you so much for accepting. Yeah, um, and I will, I will echo her. that. Uh, not only should we be excited about having uh, Kathleen with us, but we should be looking forward to extraordinary contributions from her. She is a, you know, just an, an amazing thought leader uh, with extraordinary accomplishments and uh, you know, is, is really the subject of universal praise. So thank you. For, and, and she has just an uncompromising calendar. So the fact that she's willing to take time away to join us and contribute to our urgent uh, work is further testament to her leadership. And uh, I'm just thrilled that she accepted our invitation to join us. So Kathleen, let me echo uh, Commissioner Anaya's words and uh, tell you that I personally, and on behalf of this group, I'm deeply grateful to you. Thank you, Commissioner Lane and Commissioner Anaya. And the, the honor one is- other, One other thing, we could barely hear you. You're so soft-spoken. Oh, I'm so sorry. Yes, the, the, the pleasure is all mine. Thank you well, so much for we'll, having me. We'll see, you know. we'll see about that, but thank you. We appreciate it. So, uh, Madam Chair, with your permission, I think we can uh, get into the uh, the main event here. Would that be appropriate? Absolutely. Thank you, uh, Co-Chair, um, uh, Vice Chair Elaine. Yes, take it away. Thank you. So I, I, I will take it. Um, so we are really uh, very fortunate today to have uh, two uh, key leaders of Chicago Community Trust join us. Uh, each is uh, a, uh, a, an extraordinary subject matter expert, and uh, they will be providing to us uh, testimony. I think we're gonna find very valuable, and as I will connect a little later in the session, uh, ties uh, directly to earlier testimony and a pre-existing initiative on which the commission is working. So uh, welcome to Ayana Kachoris, who uh, holds the title of Senior Director of Policy and Advocacy at the Chicago Community Trust, which means that she leads the trust's local, state, and federal policy strategy. 
Uh, before that, uh, she held a similar role with the uh, University of Chicago's Office of Civic Engagement, and before that was uh, uh, in a leadership role at the MacArthur Foundation. Um, so sh she is obviously a leader uh, wherever she goes, and obviously she understands Cook County, and she understands the, the landscape, the problems, and the opportunities, and she will be addressing all of those. And I'm also uh, thrilled to have with us today, Janae uh, Defel, who is the uh, leader of the Community Desk Chicago, which is uh, a program affiliate of the trust that leverages uh, private market philanthropic and investor relationships to secure capital uh, for uh, transformative re uh, real estate development projects, which is much of what we're going to be uh, talking about. And uh, she has herself over, over 20 years of relevant experience, although looking her, at her, one would think that's impossible. It must be, it must be clean living, Janae, but we're happy to have both of you here. Now, Irene, do you by chance have the slides? Because that may be an integral part of this presentation. And let me see if I can pull them up. Irene, okay, you... thank you. We would appreciate that. And then uh, when that happens, in either order that the two of you prefer, I invite you to move forward with your testimony. Thank you so much. Great. And thank you, commissioners, for, for inviting us to provide testimony today. Um, I'm, I can share my screen if that's possible, um, if you'd like me to do that. Um, it might make it easier for driving. Oh, yeah, I can't. We, we could do that. Um, Irene, can you please make her a co-host? Yes. One moment, please. Okay, we're all set. Okay. Okay, can you all see that? Looks like that may be a yes. No. It, it's loading, but it looks like it's getting there. Yeah. Oh. It's okay. It's telling me it's paused on my end. So let me stop and see if I can do that again. Can you see that now? Yes. Yes. Okay. Terrific. Thank you. Great. Sometimes technology works in our favor. So um, again, appreciate the opportunity to present to you all today. Um, it's nice to see some familiar faces as well as some new uh, ones as well. Um, my name is Yana Kachoris, as Mark uh, Commissioner Lane said. I am um, the Senior Director for Policy and Advocacy at the Trust, and I'm really pleased that um, my colleague Janae DeFell can join us, could join me today in this presentation as she is truly the subject matter expert on this. But we thought it would be really um, important to kind of ground you all in um, why the trust is interested in this topic of community investment vehicles and how this feeds into our um, broader strategic vision at the Community Trust, which is the Community Foundation for the Chicago region, both the city and Cook County and how important it is for us to be focusing our efforts on closing the racial and ethnic wealth gap. Um, as you all know, this is part of a long-term strategic vision that has been set out um, by our leadership um, to really uh, aim towards a thriving and equitable connected Chicago region. And we're doing that in a variety of ways. Um, and we really think about the strategy that we're pursuing as an integrated one that thinks both about individual wealth building opportunities, community wealth building opportunities at the neighborhood level, um, and, and how we amplify and elevate community voice, and at the same time address the sort of ongoing critical needs that we know exist in our communities and that we as a community foundation are here to serve and to really connect philanthropy to those opportunities where um, their philanthropic giving can make a difference in communities. Something that's new for us um, over the last couple of years is that we're really taking a much closer look at how we can use the voice and the platform that we have as the Chicago Community Trust as a public charity to advocate for those policies and systems changes that we know are going to be critical for us to address to close the racial and ethnic wealth gap. Um, some of the policies that you all are well familiar with um, have 
brought us to the place we are today in, in the racial and ethnic wealth gap that we see. Um, it's no more ever than in um, inequities and in home ownership rates and the wealth that families have um, uh, through uh, some of the policies at the early part of the 20th century and who was able to access um, home loans, FHA loans, uh, accessing the GI Bill coming back from World War II and those, those um, uh, systemic inequities were built into the systems that we are still living with a legacy of those today. And so how we, we believe without thinking about those um, longstanding barriers and structural issues, if we don't look at policy as a tool to get us out, we will just continually be working at the edges of the problem and not at the root causes. Um, so we are ever more focused on how we can and look to policy and systems change. And I think that's in alignment with the, the mission of this, um, this commission. So we appreciate the opportunity to share our perspective with you. Um, I will just go on to talk a little bit more about some of the core strands to our work. Um, we are really focused on individual wealth, growing household wealth, and that really cuts across a variety of different issues. It looks both at income, um, economic security, economic stability that families have without stable income, it's very difficult to build wealth. We look at the asset picture that folks have, whether it's uh, owning a home or owning a small business. Um, and we also look at what opportunities folks have to um, access capital and, and um, access uh, that kind of capital in a way that's not extractive. So we know that there's a number of um, lending practices that we see in communities that disproportionately impact black and brown communities. We wanna see those end. Um, and you know, even things like fines and fees that um, uh, are of course, that also disproportionately impact communities of color. So we really think about the full picture of wealth, not just one um, element of that equation. Um, we're also looking at catalyzing neighborhood investment, and this is um, an area of work that the community desk is really squarely aligned with, um, which is how we catalyze neighborhood investment. How do we bring public sector investment, private capital um, to bear in um, investing in communities that have been disinvested and underinvested for too long? And we know that um, if commu as communities are underinvested, um, it's very difficult for individuals living in those communities to also realize the, the wealth that can come from, from building assets um, in those communities. Um, and then finally, our strand, our focus on building collective power, I mentioned um, earlier, really thinking about how do we amplify community voice um, and, and the perspective of community residents and those who are um, have the most um, experience to bring to bear on how we design policy solutions um, and, and empower those organizations working in communities, um, grassroots organizers, local media organizations that are telling the stories of what's happening in community, and making sure those are part of and driving converse conversations around the policy and system changes we wanna see. And all of these things we believe are critical to closing the racial and ethnic wealth gap that if we allow uh, the gap to continue and don't very intentionally think about this, um, this inequity, it's gonna hold our entire region back. And so that's really what's animating all of our work. I wanted to spend a little, just a, a couple of moments on our approach to catalyzing neighborhood investment because I think it's really core to why community investment vehicles are part of this. And it's also kind of sits at the nexus of all three of the um, strategies that, that I mentioned. Um, and the work that is being led by our colleague, Michael Davidson, who is not, um, wasn't able to join us today. Um, this, this work is, is, is his, his baby, but we, we often work very in, in close alignment. So hopefully I can do it justice, um, but he will be available for follow-up if anybody has questions. But the work around catalyzing neighborhood investment is really around how do we create the conditions for collaborative community investment, as I mentioned, the sort of the, the, the need to bring multiple layers of capital to bear in communities, and how do we have those organizations, strong organizations based in and rooted in community to make those um, uh, solutions possible. Um, and these are just some examples of the way that we do that, providing flexible funding to community-based organizations um, 
helping support leaders in community and providing support for the kinds of collaboration that are required to make neighborhood investment come to fruition. Um, we are also really focused on how we can help provide um, the, the space for collaboration around taking collective action around a specific place-based um, or issue-based plan. And then finally, the connection to policy and systems change about how do we think about the financial systems and the policy solutions that help drive investment towards and into communities. And then lastly, I just wanted to say a couple of words about how the trust is showing up in policy and advocacy work and, and how we look at examples like community investment vehicles to help lead towards some of the policies that um, need to create the enabling environment for these solutions to actually have the impact that we want to see and, and the role that piloting um, and, and the role that philanthropy can play in helping to um, advance pilots and, and programmatic and develop programs and solutions to advance policy and systems change. So some of the work we're doing there is really around how do we create the environment to be more receptive for those policy ideas. So building knowledge and public will around some of the challenges in, in the case of this um, issue is how difficult um, uh, some of the um, uh, development challenges that are in community. Um, we're supporting research and publication, some of the exploration that um, Janae is gonna walk you through and how that builds toward momentum towards policy and systems change. And we're also investing in the ecosystem of organizations who are doing this work. So it's grant support we're able to provide, but also investing in leaders who are doing the work. And then once we have identified these policy solutions, how can we advocate and use our voice and our platform to achieve um, policy solutions? And we've been very focused most recently on um, how can we help achieve an equitable and inclusive recovery as all of these federal dollars are flowing into our region? Where can we see um, and leverage those dollars as a as potential for creating some of those systems change we want to see? So Commissioner Anaya, your, your comments earlier around the way that the county is um, um, innovating around the use of those dollars is, is exciting to see and, and we're, we're very interested um, in those. Um, just sharing briefly our uh, what I'm loosely calling a policy agenda, but these are some areas where we're really focusing our attention across the range of issues that we're working on at the trust. Um, and I, I won't go into detail here, but the work that Janae is doing really kind of, um, and, and the work of uh, the desk is really kind of we see is aligned with the work around vacant land um, and how we bring vacant land back to um, you know, the asset that it really can be for communities and really invest in um, those vacant and underutilized properties in um, black and brown communities. And, and we hope that um, there's, there's only gonna be more, more attention paid to this because of the federal resources and we hope we can help capitalize on that. So with that context, um, I just I, I would really love to hand it over to my colleague Janae DeFell, who, as I mentioned earlier, has really been spending the most of her time on this issue and is, is truly the expert um, on community investment vehicles. And this is this is the meat of the and the crux of what you want to hear about. Um, but look forward to continuing the conversation with all of you. And with that, I'll hand it over to Janae. Thank you, um, and thank you to everyone for allowing us to participate in today's session. Um, again, as mentioned previously, I am Janae DeFell, uh, Director of Community Desk Chicago, um, and I probably will date myself um, as I just briefly give you a little bit of context on my background. So I've worked for um, both in the um, federal government perspective, sort of managing um, and making facility recommendations for the Office of um, Head Start, uh, HHS. Um, I've worked for 10 years at a CDFI, in particular um, IFF, sort of working in community spaces and really sort of helping to address um, issues around facility access and management of real estate and um, dating myself even earlier and saying that I used to work for Arthur Anderson, which no longer exists. So that might give you a little bit of perspective um, around my experience <laughs> and date myself to a certain extent. So, um, you know, I really come to this work uh, in a, with a broad range of experience from management consulting to um, sort of the municipal setting from Village of Oak Park. Um, and as I mentioned, the federal government, but then also working at a CDFI uh, where I've worked both in Chicago and in Detroit. And I was actually in Detroit 
working at that CDFI at the t- right after um, they filed bankruptcy. So um, I saw a lot of similarities as I've come back to Chicago and some of the challenges that that, that, that community faced when literally it was a city where the lights were shut off. And so I'm bringing a lot of sort of that working knowledge and some of the similarities to Chicago as we're thinking about ways to support communities in revitalization. And so Community Dash Chicago, um, as my colleague mentioned, uh, we are a program affiliate of the Chicago Community Trust. And so taking this position, really my role is to sit within um, the sort of philanthropic space and try to think about and work with my colleagues on creative ecosystem solutions to really address some of the issues that we're seeing in these communities. And one of the things that I can tell you um, nationally, and I think some of this is coming from the civil unrest, is that you're really seeing a spike across the country of where communities are taking investment and they're taking opportunities to revitalize into their own hands. And so they're doing a lot of capital pooling. Um, They're joining their neighbors and and raising money to to buy properties and and, and, um, develop worker co-ops because they're seeing that existing systems have failed them. And so they're taking a much more grassroots um, bootstrap approach to how they are, they're changing their community. So we're seeing this more and more nationally. And so I I definitely appreciate the compliments around um, subject matter expert. I will say that this space is fairly new. And um, as part of our research, uh, which was funded by the Kresge Foundation last year, we looked at uh, probably close to 20 models And a number of those models were really an incubation stage. And um, the majority of them had really been operating less than five years. So again, this is a fairly new space. And um, we're really looking to think about ways to build that capacity within the city of of Chicago. So let me talk a little bit about community investment vehicles. So often we use the term um, community wealth building models. And so, you know, quickly to put community investment vehicles into context, Community wealth building sort of is a very broad word that could range from worker co-ops where you've got, you know, a group of folks who are collectively working um, on a product or a solution and there's a shared ownership in that and in that particular business. Worker co-ops have been around for a long time. Um, we've got a ton of them in the city of Chicago and even worker co-ops to some degree. So these things have been have been around. But what I can say um, that seems to be fairly new in various models, so you'll see here, you know, there's models from Kansas City to Portland. Um, There's really been sort of a recent pivot to where you have residents who are literally taking ownership of commercial and residential properties, and they are allowing um, residents to directly invest in those projects and those properties. And so we did about an eight month month study uh, really looking at, you know, what does it take to be successful in this space? And what is a CIV, which is a um, a collective uh, local ownership of commercial and real estate property. So essentially it is a legally governing body where there is uh, dollars involved and folks are collectively um, pooling capital. And there's really sort of five areas. Yana, if you could just pull it down just a second, which I'll talk you through fairly quickly. Um, We found that there was five components that were very critical to this work. One of them is purpose and process. So who's involved, who's leading it, the funding involved, the governance, what assets are they gonna own, and then ultimately the external stakeholders. So I do wanna spend some time in the external stakeholder role because I think that's really where the county can play a significant role. So what is a community investment vehicle? Again, just quickly, um, it really is, it's about a way of giving community owners um, ownership over their properties, development, and their future. And so it could be focused on housing, it could be focused on commercial development, and then there's other creative investments. So we've seen structures get created where communities are lending money to businesses, right? So so again, it's all about sort of that collective capital pooling, um, where residents have a direct say um, in what's happening in their community. And then depending on the purpose of the model, there's generally been two purposes for these sort of community investment vehicles or sort of share ownership models. Those two are community stabilization and revitalization and or community and individual wealth building. 
And the reason why I want to pause there for a second is because depending on what the objectives are for the community, each one of them could take a, a, a different path. So community stabilization and revitalization doesn't necessarily mean that there's cash directly provided to that family for investing in that particular property. It's more about how do we stabilize and have sort of a joint ownership of the community. The second one, the community and individual wealth building really is creating a structure or a vehicle where these residents actually get paid dividends. So it's very important and what we learned in our research is it's very important to really work with community and give them that roadmap so they're clear about what their North Star is because ultimately that North Star will impact their ability to really uh, play a role in the wealth building. And again, depending on that legal and financial characteristics, they can take on very different, um, very different legal structures. So I think that you guys have been thinking about a trust. We've seen folks set up as benefit corporations, um, cooperatives. So there's a number of different legal structures. And again, the output will really drive um, what that legal structure is, how that legal structure is defined. Next slide, please. So again, as I briefly mentioned, these are all the components of a CIV. Uh, and just for the interest of time, I won't go through these in complete details, but again, you know, as you guys are thinking about the role and the strategy that you want to play in this space, I think it's really important to just spend a couple of minutes talking about all of these elements to make sure that communities are successful. So again, as I mentioned, purpose and process. What is the North Star of the CIV? Is it really about communities actually getting cash in hand or is it about turning the control over to communities to be able to do and have a say in how commercial properties are used to maintain affordable housing? Um, funding and investments. Are we talking about a fundraising from a community level? Are we gonna allow for philanthropy investing? How could the county play a role in thinking about investing in these at, at the community level? And we'll talk a little bit about that. I mentioned legal and governance and assets um, and operations. So are we talking about housing projects? Are we talking about commercial projects? And then as I've mentioned previously, external stakeholders. So we do know that uh, municipal agencies like you know, the county could play a critical role in the success of these CIVs. So I'm just gonna highlight a couple of different sections in each one of these. So um, again, I think the most important as we're talking about purpose and process, I really can't stress enough, is really as you're thinking about what role that the county would wanna play in helping a community to roll out a, a CIV strategy is really understanding what is the intended purpose for that particular neighborhood or that, for that particular community. It's also important to really understand where the residents come into play. Um, we all know that in, in, that in low income communities, there is often already a challenge of how they're managing um, their finances. So do they have bank accounts? And so when you start to talk about a community investment vehicle, there really needs to be a strategy around how are we engaging residents? How are we educating them on investments? So this list is sort of a real short list of, of, of the things that you need to consider as you're thinking about the purpose and process of, the, of a CIV and the potential role that the county could play. So for funding and investment, um, again, uh, you know, for the real estate folks on the room, you know, you, you may have heard the word capital stack. And so essentially what this means is if a community is looking to buy five properties on a commercial corridor, how does that get paid, right? How does that get funded? Is it funded in part because there is 50% of a, of a fundraising effort that happens at the community level? Is the county layering in with some bond financing? Like, what does that capital stack look like? And ultimately, what does that return look like for the community? Income generation, right? So how do you want it? How does the CIV make money? Um, and if you are inviting outside investors to this sort of uh, community wealth building model or CIV, um, are you going to prioritize that the community is going to get a larger return compared to some of our uh, mission-driven investors? So again, this is just a quick checklist of all the things that would really need to be considered from a funding and an investment standpoint. Next slide, please. Legal and governance. So as I mentioned um, very early on, you can see here from this rolling list, I mean, there are a ton of different legal structures that um, the community wealth building models or community investment vehicles can take from benefit corporations to L3Cs to LLCs um, and ultimate even nonprofits. 
But as I alluded to um, earlier in my comments, you know, if you set up a community investment vehicle as a nonprofit, a nonprofit can't issue dividends. So this is why it's so important that as you're thinking about, as, as communities are thinking about, you know, these models, are they thinking about it in the context of what's their North Star? So is it, do you really want residents to actually get a dividend check at the end of the year? And if that question is yes, the nonprofit is not the legal structure. So we, we wanna spend that time up front in the purpose and process because then the legal structure is gonna be so important. Compliance and governance, who is on the board? So even if you have mission-driven investors, does the community still drive the bus when it comes to the governance? And what does that look like? So again, this is just a checklist of some of the key things we found in the legal governance. Next slide, please. Assets and operations. Um, so this is also important. Um, and I think it also ties back to purpose and process. So, you know, if you have a community that's concerned about affordable housing, a community investment vehicle or a community wealth building model could be used to essentially acquire properties and maintain affordable housing in those communities. And you can also take that one level down and say, we're gonna acquire the properties, we're gonna offer affordable housing. And because we can actually model this to be somewhat profitable, the residents can actually make money from offering affordable housing. I mean, so there's a number of ways that, that you can look at this. Same thing for the commercial corridors. We often see um, you know, in lower income uh, communities of color, very extract, extractive landlords um, and blighted properties on these corridors. And so is this an opportunity for residents, which we're already seeing now, um, they're buying up these properties collectively together, and then they're in a much better position to control the type of retail and commercial space and how it's used to really activate um, their community and, and provide a different experience for the residents that live there. So this really just kind of talks about the property types and who's gonna run it? Are you gonna get a property manager? So we wanted to sort of spell this out as, as an understanding around assets and operations. So as we move to the next slide um, and talk a little bit about external stakeholders, I really think that this is the role and where there may be opportunities for the county to lean in. And so, as I mentioned um, you know, earlier, this study was really to look at, um, in part, the role that philanthropy could play, but it was also intended to provide the roadmap for what this would look like in Chicago. And so there's been a lot of conversations um, with my philanthropic partners, including the trust, to, to lean in and think about ways that, that, that foundations can support this work. And one of them being sort of supporting the early upfront planning through grant making. Um, and there's also an opportunity for, for philanthropy to support this role through impact investing. We see that happening a lot, um, as well as sort of addressing policy and programming needs of the communities. But if we step into the role of philanthropy, I mean, of, of, of municipality and municipality agencies, there is a role for you all to play. Um, and some of the things here if you, uh, that we could sort of talk through a little bit, um, one of them is being, you know, in communities, you can have a community plan, but if you don't have access to the properties and you don't control the properties, that's also very challenging. So municipalities could play a role in really sort of um, streamlining access to some of these offline properties or assets that the, that the county owns to allow uh, these organizations to begin to build their wealth building model around properties that are easily accessible. Uh, tax abatement. So again, as we're thinking about trying to support these communities in creating these models, um, they have to be financially feasible. And so, you know, supporting through tax abatements um, is, is often, you know, a good way to sort of help to, uh, to, to jumpstart their investments and sort of help them to build a reserve because there's, there's an opportunity to build up their assets over time. Long-term debt through bond fi financing or other specialized financing. So the other thing that we know, you know, for the, for the financial folks or the bankers on the call is that commercial loans are often five to seven years and you have to refinance them. So is there an opportunity for bond financing or some long-term debt to really sort of support these projects? Because, you know, one thing that's different about community wealth building models or community ownership models um, compared to if this was a for-profit, um, they're not providing education trainings for residents to be able to invest. So there is um, an additional layer of cost that comes when you want to make a more inclusive model 
compared to this being sort of a private banker approach to this work. So having more long-term and favorable debt financing definitely helps to make, to make things work. Um, municipal and city subsidies. So again, you know, as, as, as they're thinking about potentially buying properties, um, are, is there funding to help with the repairs if it's housing? Or is there funding available to support, you know, the renovation of the storefronts and put up new signage? So those sort of city subsidies will work. Fast tracking, permitting, and municipal approvals. Um, you know, as we all know, time is money. So are there, these are also ways of sort of cutting the cost on these projects and making them a more financially viable, but also literally contributing to a potential wealth building opportunity for residents. And then also enforce the sale and improvement of blighted properties. I mean, this is a huge issue as we think about the South and the West Side um, prop, uh, communities that are that are that are saturated with the with blighted properties. So, um, so this is just sort of an example of some of the things that you know, from an external stakeholder perspective, would be truly beneficial. And so, you know, just wanted to give you a bit of a soundbite uh, in terms of the role that a municipal agency can play. Um, so quickly, you know, just to kind of model this out, I want to just jump down just so to give you a little bit of a visual chart in terms of how does this all come together. And so essentially, you, you heard me, if you look at the top part of this diagram, you heard me talk about purpose and process, funding and investment, legal governance, assets and operations. These are all components that ultimately need to feed into that CIV structure that gets defined. And these things need to be taken seriously because ultimately that impacts the types of projects that the CIV can invest in and ultimately the impact that they want. So a CIV, once it's properly structured, and again, we're looking at this from, an, from a real estate perspective, not as a worker co-op, the CIV could be a pool of capital, let's just say $10 million. And that CIV, which could have $10 million in it and maybe 500 residents investing in it, they have the ability at that point to purchase properties solely owned by the CIV. So that's bucket number one. Bucket number two could be the CIV, which we often hear a lot as well in communities where you have private developers coming into the communities and the communities don't have an option to be an equity partner in these developments. The CIV could also take a portion of that capital and be a partner with private developers. That's also an opportunity for those um, communities to, to make, um, to make a, a, a dividend. And then thirdly, I talked a little bit about there are some creative models where you have these community wealth building structures lending to each other. And so depending on the path that that CIV takes, the impact could be a number of things from building and circulating community wealth. So you're actually making money. It could be more empowerment because now the community owns the assets, or it could be truly just community stabilization. We just want to occupy the properties in a trust, and we know that this will be something that will remain in the community, you know, ongoing through, through a trust structure. So there's a different number of different paths that the CIV can take. So I think we should be coming up on the last few slides. I want to just keep going. Um, and so briefly, this is just a, a, a a quick recap of what we captured during our research. So it was very clear when we talked to residents um, during our work that communities want control and they want maximum control. It was also very apparent that communities were very interested in direct wealth opportunities and wealth opportunities meaning they're getting dividends, their assets are appreciating, and then also is there an opportunity to keep the money in the community and create this circular economy? And then finally, opportunity, you know, so they want to be in a position where they themselves can acquire the necessary capital and rapidly respond and compete with private market cash buyers as they're thinking about how to revitalize their community. Next slide. So from a community readiness perspective, you know, this is the things that we know are, are really sort of as we think about this work. Um, from, a, from a trust perspective and a desk perspective is that there, you know, for this to be successful and whether or not it's, it's, it's something that's viable in communities is that they really do have to have a common share ownership goal. Like what is the desire for the community? Um, what are the wealth building opportunities? So again, what, what are they looking to accomplish in structuring a community wealth building model? 
And then the other one that we know seems to be very common is, is, is there an at-risk affordability? So if there's really an issue where they're concerned about, you know, the stability and gentrification of their neighborhoods, this is also maybe a good tool um, for community. And then really to launch this from a real estate perspective, you know, not thinking about some of the other shared ownership models is that you really have to have a very strong community lead. And at the end of the day, you have to have properties that's, that's available for them to acquire. So again, this is also, as I mentioned earlier, an opportunity for the county to potentially play a, a, you know, a very critical role in, in providing sort of that first access to properties to help them build out uh, what, what could be a community investment vehicle. So um, this is, can be a fairly complicated topic, uh, but wanted to be respectful of your time. Uh, we probably have about 60 more pages of documentation that we can share, um, but wanted to sort of give you a quick sound bite um, and not necessarily put you to sleep. So would love and welcome any questions or follow-up uh, from our presentation today. Uh, we're, we're happy to, to answer any questions. Well, thanks very much to both of you. And uh, the more you talk, the more excited we get. So you're hardly putting us to sleep. This is, uh, th this is what we're all about. And uh, thank you for, to both of you for everything you do. A um, couple of observations, and then I'd like to turn this over to the commissioners for the questions they may have. Uh, one is, yes, by all means, if you would kindly share with us uh, any materials that are available to us uh, so as to fully inform us. Um, and, and thank you for your, your uh, insights and your uh, research findings. Um, also, thank you. Uh, the, the trust has, in fact, committed to work collaboratively with the commission in driving these sorts of agendas. So thanks to both of you. Thanks also uh, to Mike Davidson, who, as many of you may know, is a senior director of community impact at the trust, who uh, leads much of this effort. Uh, and we will certainly uh, look to collaborate with the trust as we move forward. But let me open this up to questions, and I might have a couple of my own, but uh, let's, let's see who has what questions. And I know a couple of questions were raised even during the course of the testimony. So let me kind of take you by sequence. Who, 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 who had asked a question? We're seeking to ask a question, please. There's two people with their hands up, uh, Commissioner Guajardo and Commissioner Malone, and then we can go over the ones that were in the chat. Okay. So why don't we take it in that order, if we would, please. Hey, thank you so much. This is Ana Guajardo with Centro de Trabajadores Unidos United Workers Center in the Southeast side of Chicago. CCT, thank you for all the support for the organization um, in terms of our community work. Um, we, along with actually Solchid and um, Roger, have been involved in different efforts to pass state legislation to recognize worker co-ops, um, in addition to try to work with the city of Chicago and the county also to pass the resolution recognizing worker co-ops. I'm trying to understand um, how CIB actually plays, like what role it plays with a worker co-op. Very familiar with worker co-ops. I'm just not fully understanding how that could be seen as a worker co-op and and then I have probably a lot of follow-up questions, but I might as well ask them, um, just assuming that maybe it is kind of like the worker co-op model, um, then who would oversee that? Like what role would the county be in? How do we ensure that the county plays an ins instrumental role, but doesn't have full control of decisions, right? Mm -hmm. Or like how, what type of funding will be provided? Because for worker co-ops, like, as you mentioned, there's a lot of support that needs to, you know, a lot of support that workers and worker co-ops need in terms of financial assistance. Um, like, you know, we have one co-op where we had to break it down how to even go into your bank account, right? And how do you even open up a Gmail account, right? Or not Gmail, uh, email account. So I'm just running like, one is, you know, and is this like kind of like a, uh, a housing co-op maybe? And if so, how does that actually play with, so that I'm sure you get it. Like I'm a little yeah, bit great, great. So great question. Um, and so uh, and thank you for lifting that up because it, this is a very complex topic, and you're sort of trying to cram it into a 20 minute presentation. So worker co-ops, housing co-ops, and community investment vehicles are all community wealth building, a community wealth building model. So for a worker co-op, you're investing in a business. Is that correct? Is my understanding? So you're investing in a business. So with that worker co-op, you could be in a rental space. You could be running your co-op in a rental space. 
With the community investment vehicle, you are investing in real estate. So it's not necessarily investing in a business. So that's the difference. In some cases, wealth building models are investments in businesses. In some cases, their investment in housing, which is a real estate component. In other cases, there are investments in commercial property. So for example, one of the models that I believe you guys were looking at was the Portland um, Community Investment Trust. Mm -hmm. And so this team led by Mercy, um, Mercy Corporation actually acquired a shopping center. And for that acquisition of the shopping center, residents were allowed to basically come in as a shareholder that would gain profits from the profitability of that shopping center. So that's not a worker co-op, it is an investment in real estate. And so, but all of these are different examples of wealth building models where essentially you are collectively pooling resources for a wealth building opportunity. Um, and so you're also correct in saying similar to worker co-ops, there does need to be a whole body, body of work around how do you prepare residents to start investing in real estate, right? Because if they, if they are a renter, they rent their current, a current apartment, um, you know, what do they, they may not have experience in now becoming a shareholder in the acquisition of a shopping center. So you do have to educate them. So the model in Portland, they have a whole financial literacy curriculum set up. And so as part of our analysis, we looked at what would it cost to do that? And so that was the role um, that, that the ph ph philanthropy could play. So when we were talking to community um, trust, the, the Chicago Community Trust, they could play a role in the grant making side to build out that community engagement component and educate residents on how they invest. So I hope that sort of helps to put things in, in context. I just have a quick follow up. So Sure. I, I understand what you're saying in terms of the investment. Um, like when we incubate worker co-ops, you know, obviously anyone who wants to form a co-op can do it themselves, you know, but some of us actually, you know, use that as an opportunity to teach folks. Unless people are, are knowledgeable or are able to find these resources, I guess I'm not understanding, like, unless, unless you just provide that information, is there a particular entity that's also incubating these type of CIBs? So, and if so, who are they? That's correct. So. To my working knowledge, again, as I mentioned, this is this is a fairly new topic. There is no CIV incubator in Chicago, right? What I have seen nationally is there have been organizations that have been supported by professionals to build out their CIV model. So you have the port, like I said, the Portland uh, Community Investment Trust. You have the Kensington Trust. I mean, there's probably 20 different models but they're not all connected. I mean, essentially it is a group of residents um, and in some cases nonprofits who have built out these models. And so where, so, so when you build out the model, you create the governance structure. So similar to your worker co-op, there's a governance structure to get set up in this investment vehicle. And that governance structure is gonna, is really gonna drive who gets the profits, where does the profits go, what buildings are you buying, the level of education that its residents are coming in. Uh, one of the interesting components about the, um, the model in Portland is they have, a, they have a return guarantee for the residents. So if they invest in that commercial strip mall, they're guaranteed, they have a relationship with the local bank where they're guaranteed that if that resident decided that they wanted their money back, they were guaranteed to get a 2% return. But these are all things that individually gets built out on a CIV basis based off of the legal structure and the objectives of what they're looking to do. Does that provide some additional clarification? It does, but if I'm correct, maybe Sochin Roger can help me. What you just mentioned seems like a consumer co-op, not a worker co-op. It's not a worker co-op. Oh, okay. I see. This it. is so it's this is not <laughs> this is not a work. A worker co-op is a direct investment in a business. Community investment vehicles, from our point of view, is, is an investment in real estate. So you're investing in housing, you're investing in, in commercial strip malls, you're investing in you know, retail corridors you know, on the south and the west side or north side suburbs, um, but it's not investing directly in the business. So that would be a correct statement. 
Hi, um, this is such a uh, such a I just want to. Um, I think this is the way I'm understanding Anna. Um, I think it's just semantics because we use different terms in different spaces about, you know, in the city of Chicago, I just I put a um, a message how the, we're calling it community wealth building, right? Um, we, in our in certain spaces we call it restorative economy, solidarity economy. It might be a little radical for certain spaces, but it's the same thing. It's basically um, what it comes down to is. Like, you know, no matter what institution organizations you're building, what you're building is um, where the, the, the question is like, who actually has the control? And the control should be either the workers, that's a worker co-op. If it's a consumer, the consumer has the co-op. If it's, you know, some sort of community fund, the residents have the control. So it really is just the, asking the question, like who would, who would have the control to run you know, or you know of this institution and that's the question and so i think that should clarify like it's more of like a little bit it's not just about worker co-ops it's a whole about the whole vision about um community wealth building and i think that's what you're referring to yeah right? that, that's absolutely correct i mean i, I think all of these the community the civ the um the worker co-op the housing co-ops these are all things that sit under the community wealth building umbrella. And you're absolutely correct in the sense that it's really about, is, is this an investment um, or is this a collaborative that is controlled and owned by the community? Absolutely. And we are actually working closely with the city. Um, we've been very involved with um, a lot of their work this past summer. And we had representatives from the city um, as part of our, our research group um, this, this past summer to make sure that we were aligned and in sync with with some of the, the efforts happening right now across the city. Thank you for, for sharing that. Other questions? So Commissioner Malone, Commissioner DeBoe, and then I'll pull up the ones from the chat. There's been quite a lot of conversation happening there. Okay, Commissioner Malone, if you'd be so kind. Hi, everyone. Thank you guys so much for coming. Uh, we I really enjoyed your presentation. Um, my name is Morgan. I work at Farpoint. I manage Bronzeville Lakefront. And so we have actually also been talking a lot about community wealth building and community ownership. And you guys kind of answered one of my questions. I was going to say, are there samples of how this has already been done in the city of Chicago? Because we're, I mean, it's, it's kind of one thing to do it on like a 20,000 square foot building in a community that's an adaptive reuse versus trying to do it on 12 million square feet of new construction. Um, and it's just different costs and a different model. And one of the things I would ask you all is, have you seen this work with a large scale GP for like a district, right? Because we know that things of this scale have the ability to completely transform a neighborhood, right? Like 100 acres is a lot of space. So when you start thinking about that and you know that a big GP or a big LP is gonna come in and do a sizable percentage um, and have very clear um, thoughts about who gets to invest alongside and how many small investors they're willing to take on, et cetera, et cetera. You get into the nuance and the weeds of like how to make something like this happen. So I, I guess I would ask you, are there district scale samples of a CIV? Um, I know Navy Yards has committed about 5% of equity per building. Uh, but I don't, I'm not clear on their model. So I just wanted to ask that if you don't have any so references. You, so Yana, could you pull up that diagram for me again? Um, so, so I guess I would, to respond to your question, it is not my, to my knowledge right now, I am not aware of a model in the city of Chicago where there has been a community investment vehicle structured at the community level that is allowing for an open investment across the community. What we have seen is a number of developers are using crowdfunding platforms to raise capital for projects. And so, yeah, this one here. So what we're trying to do is to figure out and work with community to build at the ground level capital pooling to be in a position to invest in your project. So let me give you in a scenario. If I understand you correctly, your model would fall in bucket number two, property owned in partnership. So a lot of times what developers are doing is they are, they are doing these projects and then they're saying, we have a $10 million gap 
to complete this real estate project and they're crowdfunding through a platform to allow for communities to make an investment. And what we're proposing is in these communities to have communities ready with capital in a community investment structure that when you come into their neighborhood, they're in a better position to negotiate and say, okay, we want a 5% equity stake in this large scale developer development and we can come with our portion of the developer equity to be a critical stakeholder in the project. Um, so that is kind of how we're viewing it. Um, but to my working knowledge, there's not, there has not been a large scale project of that magnitude done in Chicago. And I will tell you that most of the models that we looked at um, were very focused um, at the community level, meaning they were community dri driven and not necessarily developer driven. And then if there was one more slide that you all had like right above here that said what the possibilities for the municipals were. And I just mm -hmm. also wanted to ask a little bit about, um, I think, you know, between with the work of the assessor's office um, and I know there's some really amazing policy folks over there who are open to having conversations about community wealth building. And this has been a bit of a priority for them over the last couple of years. Um, I would ask about the bond finance, bond financing. And I am asking about that because I, um, you know, I'm probably a person that would say that the city, the county and the state have too many bonds, <laughs> um, which obviously has a direct impact on the property taxes that people are paying um, to finance these bonds. So have you all, um, and obviously there are other things you can do besides GO bonds, but what types of bond financing are you seeing? Are you seeing social impact bonds? What types of bond financing are you seeing in the context of supporting long-term debt, just thinking about GO bond potentially being challenging? Yeah, I mean, having come from a work in the municipal setting, it is tricky, right? When you start to talk about bond, bond financing. Um, so, so I can't say that we have any examples here in the city. I think part of, part of what we're looking, I think as we're having this discussion with you and thinking about conversations with the city and even at the state level um, is thinking through, uh, which is why you'll see sort of special, specialized financing. I think the goal um, in this bullet point is to really figure out, are there capital strategies that the municipal agencies can lean in on that allows for more flexible capital? Because again, as you probably know, commercial financing, you know, is five to five to seven years. It's a 25, 75 loan to value. And so, um, you know, this is really sort of a placeholder to think about are there strategies as you're leveraging um, your ability to, to create these types of uh, products that it would offer, you know, sort of a longer term uh, payback with a little bit less of a requirements on the equity side, because that, that's always a challenge. Um, but we don't actually have any uh, models that we looked at that actually engaged um, municipalities. And again, I can't stress enough that majority of these folks, um, these, these um, groups are, are very early um, in their process. And I see, um, glad you pointed out the Ujima uh, community investment model because we actually did talk to those folks. And that's an example, I'm looking at the chat, that's an example of where an agency is doing direct lending um, to small businesses in, um, in, their, um, in their community, but they're not doing real estate because of the, the, the high cost that it takes to really do a project. They're, they're mostly um, small business related. Um, so that was really the point of this context, but we're not aware of any model that's used that. Most of the agencies that we talk to have used um, program-related investments or PRIs because they do offer zero to three, um, three to three percent interest and is usually a little bit more flexible than traditional debt financing. So the question would be at this point in time for the county, is this a feasible solution? Any other questions? Commissioner DeBoe? Yeah, um, thank you. This was really a great presentation. Just would be interesting to hear if there's a couple of CIVs or a couple of like initiatives underway in a couple of the neighborhoods that you know, you're really excited about. You know, Just a couple of things that you think are pretty groundbreaking right now and where they're going on. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm a little hesitant to, to get into too much of the details because I know this is a public meeting. <laughs> um, 
But what I can say is um, there was a, if you follow the crane, there was a, um, a re there were residents in the South Shore community that um, recently acquired property. It was probably this past summer that they actually acquired. So the, the residents in the, in the Highlands um, uh, association that just in South Shore literally collectively pulled together their properties and acquired funding and acquired a property that was in receivership. Right. And so they are now sort of formally organizing um, their efforts to continue that work um, throughout South Shore. So it was an article actually in the in the Chicago, um, I think it was in Block Club Chicago, it was in Chicago, uh, Chicago, um, Cranes, the Cranes magazine. So, so that's one example. Um, another example, another good example in Inglewood is E.G. Wood. So E.G. Wood is another example in Inglewood where they have, um, th there's, a, there's a little bit of a, a funky model in the fact that they actually invest in both real estate and the business. So it is an opportunity for, if you are a uh, business in the particular um, building, you can invest in in their sort of co-op, their real estate co-op, if you will. Um, that's an example. But we're also seeing um, a number of folks throughout the community that are using or trying to leverage community ownership models, again, as I've mentioned before, to revitalize the commercial corridor. So we're seeing quite a bit in that space. Um, we're also starting to see um, some traction in neighborhoods like Garfield Park, where they're laser focused on housing um, that's impacting um, th two to three flat, three unit flat. So that's an issue in Garfield Park is that there is a concern ar around, you know, the fact that the conversion of these two to four unit flats being converted into single family homes. So we're starting to see some traction, some traction there. So, so I would just say that there's energy and movement around the city as a whole, but I really can't stress enough that um, aside from worker co-ops, which we know exist, and housing co-ops, which we know have existed, this is really a new space in the city. Um, and I think that there's a lot of excitement and momentum with this, this, the city of Chicago is investing $15 million in this space around community wealth building. So we're just seeing a lot of more momentum than we've ever saw in this space. Thank you. Are there other questions? Hi, I've got my hand up, uh, Mark. Please, Alderwoman, you're, you're on. Fantastic. Um, uh, this is a really great uh, presentation. So thank you all for that. Um, I'll, I'll say in my city of Chicago hat, um, this is maybe a, a follow-up uh, question to, to Wendy. Um, who are you working with in the city of Chicago? I know we've had some conversations and I believe um, still waiting to hear back from the trust uh, directly to the office of the 49th Ward. Um, but wondering, um, as you guys have been working and compiling this, what does your relationship look like in some of these projects with local government? Um, so whether it be the city or the county, or what do you see your role being in working with local government? And this within context is, you know, we're trying to work in this space, right, in the 49th Ward, and as community members or electeds or organizations are looking to start this up, um, certainly um, as there are, these are kind of new combinations, I agree with you, right? of you know, not just modeling some of the um, cooperative structures we've seen, but trying to adapt them or grow them or innovate them. So there certainly seems to be a bit of a, um, a gap in, in some expert advising. So I know that's why, how we reached out to you guys. Is that what your role is going to be? Great question. And I'm actually happy to see you on the call because we have been talking about your project internally. <laughs> so, um, it is, it is definitely in our queue. Um, I, you know, I think your question is, 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 is a valid one, um, which is the reason why I, I am being very transparent in saying that, you know, I have not found any experts in the city of Chicago, right? Because ultimately we've got to have these sort of models actually implemented. And even the folks who have nationally been doing this work are very careful to say that they're experts because in some cases they're still working through the proof of concept. Um, and in fact, Nico was the first public 
Capital was the first privately placed REIT, real estate investment trust. And we actually just saw in the news recently that they are stopping. There's no longer an investment opportunity into NICO. Um, and um, they're selling the assets. Now I could probably dissect what went wrong in that particular model, um, but we, you know, that would probably be for a different time and date. Um, but then you have folks like, again, the Portland model, which, which did very well during COVID times um, because communities had an investment in those, those shops. So they were, they were careful and concerned about making sure that the door stayed open and the lights turned on. So what is our role? Um, I think that's a great question. You know, and so, as I mentioned, this research was initially done through the lens of philanthropy and their affiliates like myself. And so, um, you know, Yana, feel free to jump in here, but I think, you know, the trust is right now, you know, evaluating how they can lean in and support communities. So are there opportunities to support them through a grant making process to carefully go through these steps? So one of the things you did not see today is, we actually have a full implementation plan that literally could walk a community through the considerations and the steps on how to do a community investment vehicle. And this has all been done in part because we've looked at so many models for eight months. Um, so there's an opportunity for, you know, the trust to play a role there. Um, there's also opportunities, again, to think about can philanthropy, and I'm just speaking broadly, um, even with some of the other uh, philanthropic partners that was involved in the research to actually do direct impact investing. So as I mentioned before, when I talked about bond financing, again, PRIs or program related investments and other um, philanthropic investments, mission driven investments could also help to make these models more financially feasible, especially when equity and equity raise is an issue. Um, the role that we plan to play at the desk is to continue to one advocate for these types of tools, which is what we're doing now and, and, and helping, you know, um, policymakers and, and funders to really understand the importance and the impact of this. But we also do plan to um, play a supportive role in helping communities to build out these models. So I do know um, I'm on the um, city of Chicago's uh, wealth building working committee working group. So I am actively involved with the mayor's office and staying connected to that and do plan to play an active role, my team to really sort of help to build out some of these models um, across the city. And in fact, we are working within a few neighborhoods right now. Um, and then we've maintained connections with a number of the models that we've seen across the city, the country. And some of those folks are actually very interested in coming into Chicago to build the capacity. Um, so we have not created a work plan to date. I think this is sort of the first start of us on our road show, if you will, to really sort of build momentum in this space. I was actually very happy because um, I spoke to um, Commissioner Wendy and Com uh, Commissioner uh, Christine earlier to this week, uh, just to talk about this work. And so I think the timing was great when, when we also talked to, to Commissioner Mark about, about us coming to speak with you today. Um, so your project is very much on our radar um, and we look forward to continuing to have conversations with you about how we can support, support the work in your award. But I think one of the things that's very important, which you noted in my presentation is having a community lead is gonna be critical and having a site or properties, because that's where you get started, especially if you're looking at this from a real estate investment perspective. Thank you. Yeah, and, and Janae, if I could just add, I think, you know, we at the trust have, because of the great work that Janae and, and has done over the last year, really to build out this body of knowledge and research and examples, you know, we, there's sort of a, a recognition that we have at the trust that this is really touches on on so many different aspects of the way that we work at the trust and have sort of elevated CIVs as a really important cross strategy initiative at the trust and really starting to organize ourselves internally around how do we think about what tools we have to bring to bear on this. So the point around impact investing, the capacity building we can help do with those community partners um, really thinking about what are the, the policy levers and the, the resource opportunities. Um, and so we, in, in many ways, we have been working on this for a really long time, but we're still at a new space um, of how we approach this and how we, um, what is our role in kind of helping that facilitate that. But we think this is a really important opportunity and we're really excited that the commission was um, eager to hear from us on this. So we, we do hope to figure out what's the right next step. 
um, you. with you Is all. Is there another question? Yeah, I, just a quick question. So um, this is more for the county, but I know Commissioner Maya stepped out, but I'm just wondering what role can the, what for, like what bigger role can the county play when it comes to purchasing of properties? Yeah, there, um, there, there, are, there are those opportunities and we're gonna be exploring them. And thank you for that question. I, I'd like to throw out a couple of questions of my own and uh, much of what I was gonna ask about has already been asked and answered. So I won't be uh, repetitive. And, I, and uh, Janae, I believe that two of the Chicago-based uh, projects that you've identified happen to be clients of our firm where <laughs> we put those together. And I can, I can um, concur that uh, you don't get locked into pre-existing patterns or models. This, is, this really invites creativity and uh, combinations of different strategies. Uh, obviously, you've alluded to the fact that these will typically have a tranche capital structure. You want to identify necessary and desirable stakeholders. You have to create financial and social value propositions for each of them to ensure their buy-in. So, but all those things kind of are in the social enterprise world anyway. But let me it kind of uh, establish as a foundation for one of the things I wanted to ask. And this is really to either of you, if you'd be so kind. Uh, one, there's been some reference to um, community lead. And I think there was a specific mention of the um, county having uh, uh, potentially a role in providing first access to properties. Um, and I don't know if you're talking about the land bank. I'm not sure exactly what you're talking about there, but let me kind of combine both of those questions and ask you as directly as I can, wh where do you see, uh, and we're gonna unfold our own process as a commission, but just from the perspective of your own experience, um, wh where do you see the optimal role the county might play uh, in not only doing this on a one-off basis, but really catalyzing this kind of a strategy more broadly, where there can be opportunities for scale and rollout, and where uh, what we do here in Cook County becomes a model that can be uh, that can be replicated or rep tweaked and replicated in other communities around the country? Where, where, do, where do you see our highest and best use in this kind of an initiative as a, as a county? Yeah, I mean, so I think that's a great question. So let me just go back to the community lead. Uh, so the reference to the community lead is when you're talking about a grassroots resident-led effort, you've got to rally the troops, right? So I use an example of you know, the article that was published around um, the community that the folks that, um, that purchased what they're calling a Bennett, Bennett Place, which is essentially a neighborhood association in a community within South Shore, that their resident association, they had a meeting, they have an economic development meeting, community um, committee, and they got together and said, hey, this building is blighted, it's on receivership, let's get together and pool our money. So when you're talking about from a community perspective, somebody has to rally the troops. So that's the reason why it's very important um, to have a community lead because- so is it, is it, does, it, does that mean a champion or does it mean more than a champion? Um, it, yeah, I mean, so I, I think that, I mean, this is a little bit of a sort of a wordsmithing at some point because it, it's a champion, but, it, but somebody has to sort of take the charge, right? Yeah, okay. But it doesn't necessarily mean that that person has to be the expert, right? Because what Understood. we recognize is, you're, I mean, you're in this space, you hire experts to help you, but the community, you need to get the community buy-in and generally that comes at the community level. So that's the reason why we're calling- so When you say know. the community level, are we mm -hmm. talking about neighborhoods? Are we talking about a city? Are we talking about a county? What do you mean by the community that, level? That, that's, a great, that's a very great question. I think it depends on your perspective. So we've had, there have been conversations even in our study of are we thinking that CIV should be at a citywide level, a county level, or, or, or at a neighborhood level, right? Yes. Uh -huh. And so to respond to you and answer that question, it depends on the North Star. So remember, I go back to purpose and process. So if, if you are looking for an opportunity to create wealth building opportunities, regardless, broadly, at the county level, then it can be at the county, right? Because you're looking- well, Let's suppose, way. given that that's the mandate of this commission, let's suppose for a moment that that's what we would seek to do. 
so what, what would be our optimal role as the agency that incubates actionable social policy recommendations for the county board? How, how should we frame this for the county board? What would, what would the ask be of the county board? What resources would, might be deployed for what purposes what role, you know, if, if you could flesh that out, and I understand this is a work in progress, but yeah, just no, from, no, I, I from, I understand. from where, you, where you're at right now, where you, the perch on which you sit, how would you think about that? So, so I understand that. And so I have to take it from my lens, right? Please. And so my, my priority is how are we improving the quality of life for community? So even though you're sitting at the county level, you're representing a, a wide variety of residents. Right. So I would be looking to put my tools and resources uh, that will have a direct impact on the ground within the neighborhoods of which you serve. So, uh, which is why I'm saying I would want to put that, I would want to support at the ground level, community level, community led, supporting those residents in Harvey or in South Holland or other places yeah. where, where they're dealing with significant blight and change in sort of the, the, the um, and change in terms of their economic dynamic, how, how can we support them? Okay, let me, let me build on what you're just saying. Yes. This may be my last question. I might mm -hmm. I reserve the right to ask one more. But <laughs> so in light not. of what you've just said, uh, it, was, it was indicated that there is no CIB uh, incubator in Chicago. And it doesn't necessarily need to be, right? Because I think what we, I mean, and I'm not saying we can't have that, but, but what I am saying is, the models across the country that we look at were not, they were not incubating CIVs. They were individual investment opportunity models. Right I hear now. you. But, but what I'm getting at is, uh, mm -hmm. no, I understand that. And each is sui generis. I, I get that too. Correct, correct. But, mm -hmm. but when we talk about the county stepping up and really empowering the neighborhoods, which is kind of the way I would put what you said into my mm -hmm. language. Yep, yep. Uh, might you think that establishing a county funded or sponsored incubator for this purpose, uh, really empowering nonprofits or social enterprises or foundations or co-ops or others that see this as a logical extension of their respective missions and way to drive positive social change. Would you see that? And I'm not trying to plant a seed here. Oh, no, that, I that's, want to get that's your, fine. I mean, so, something so, that you think might fit in the mix, or do you think that that is, is, is not the best of all possible ideas? Right. So, so if you ask me a question about highest and best use of county, right? So we've are, we, we know that there has to be some serious training and scaling of communities to do this work, right? Yeah. So I think we're using the word um, incubator, but ultimately it is how do we scale this concept and provide opportunities across the city? But I'm a firm believer that well, as we look at each one of these individual stakeholders, that the best option is to leverage what you what your maximum asset is. So again, if the county doesn't necessarily have properties, that may not be your direction. If there is any opportunity, again, for low cost capital, because if, if I think about a lot of the struggles that these yeah. um, organizations have, it literally is access to capital. It is access to the properties. So if I had to think about the highest and best use of the county, these are things that you all could potentially control. Like you all could potentially control tax abatements, like a, 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 um, a philanthropic okay. partner couldn't do that. So I would just, I would strongly recommend leaning toward your assets and your strengths as a municipal agency to support okay. this infrastructure. Because I think from an incubation standpoint, that could be stood up from a, from a nonprofit perspective, from, from philanthropy perspective. But there mm -hmm. are things that you as a government can control that your other stakeholders can't. Yeah, the, 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 the commission has really distinguished itself uh, as a convener, as a collaborator, as a catalyst. So there are a lot of different hats we can wear in order right. to drive change, but I, I very much, agree. and I'm going to ask you one other question, and this is kind sure. of, a, this is the loaded question, okay? So um, for, you're forewarned. Um, from the trust perspective, uh, if we look at these various um, entities, designs, approaches, strategies, um, uh, if the trust were to look at these, and I know the trust does on a one-off basis, um, and, and, and somebody or some organization were to raise its hand and seek 
support of the trust, whether that be PRIs, as you mentioned, or grants or mission-related investments or technical assistance or, or a planning grant or whatever, whatever the heck it might be, uh, w- would you be looking at this through the same lens that the trust looks at other funding and relationship opportunities in terms of, of the quality of management, the, the mission, the history, the theory of social change, the likelihood of, uh, of uh, social returns and so on. Would, would, the, would the same kind of criteria apply here or given your perception that this is, is new and, and innovative and disruptive, are there additional guardrails that the trust would impose on uh, collaborations with such ventures should they surface and seek to work with the trust? Yeah, so I, I, yeah, I can, I can grab that um, in part because as, as Yana mentioned, I work very closely with Mike Davison and Catalyze Neighborhood Investment. And what I can tell you is we left this research with a call, a very specific call to action to philanthropy. And so we are already, there are already three, I think potentially three um, groups, including the Alderman's group. If she's still on the call, I don't see her on the screen. We are actually already inventorying potential projects that we could lean in and support. Um, And and he would probably say if he was on this call, it's like philanthropy can take risks. So we are looking at this and I think it's very much in line with the trust in terms of catalyzing neighborhood investments, because again, we, we're looking to put the control of these communities in the hands of the community and provide direct yeah. wealth building opportunities. So, so it's a different sort of product, um, but, but we're very much ahead on the grant making. But the other thing I just wanna clarify for the record is that um, the, the Chicago Community Trust is not a private foundation. So they don't actually have PRIs. That's really no, more I get it. private. Side. I get right. It. So they would be looking at how to leverage donor advised funds. So I just want to make sure right. that I folks understand, understand that. But but I, I see this, I see this as a co-investment opportunity. You mm-hmm. know, I think yep. if the trust yep. comes in, the trust isn't likely to go in alone, I assume. So therefore I, I talk about PRIs, MRIs, other players that may um, be motivated by virtue of the, the trust leadership uh, and even kind of thinking through the what the diligence requirements are or expenditure responsibility and so on and the trust obviously has a, has a, a big footprint and others will follow its lead so that's that's why I expanded this more broadly yeah, yeah. no and yeah. if I could just add um, commissioner and, and Janae and this is a really great conversation very nitty-gritty I think one of the things that we see our role as as Janae said is about how we can take risk but in all things that we've been doing and and um, across uh, the, the range of things that the trust is invested in is that we know that we can't do anything on our own. It's, it all has to be done in partnership right. and we all need to be leveraging our strengths. And that certainly, as Janae said, the county has certain um, uh, assets to bring to bear on this. We in philanthropy have a certain um, uh, set of assets to bring to bear. And I think what is so critical about the community investment vehicle model, it really is centering community in a way. And so the idea that you know, there is no one size fits all approach. And it's really thinking about what is happening in each community and what are those opportunities there? Who are the actors? Who are the players? So in in essence, it feels like for this particular vehicle and this this approach, having a countywide incubator or countywide function isn't necessarily in the spirit of what community investment vehicles are about. It's very much about what's happening in the community and what the community, how the community sees the investment vehicle is addressing a particular need that they have. Very helpful. Thank you. I appreciate that. Great. So just, sorry, I just wanted to add that it sounds like the clear pathway for the commission to get involved is barrier reduction, and barrier removal policy to be able to enact the ability for people to engage with this. It's not necessarily a funding mechanism. It's not necessarily a program or an institution as much as it is, okay, we know we may need tax abatements. So can we work with the assessor's office to come up with a policy to reduce, to create a tax incentive for community investment vehicles and co-ops? Or can we work with the county land bank? Oop, one second, Mark, sorry. Um, Or can we work with the county land bank? Or can we work with one of those organizations to come up with a policy um, that will support people's access to these homes, access to these properties, access to financing, or access to incentives to reduce costs. So you're looking for policy solutions from us, correct, Jan and Janae? 
Yeah, I, I think I think that's part of it, right? I think the I think the the barrier reduction. I mean, the, you said it very well. I think that is that is clearly an issue. I think some of the other areas that we're working around in the catalyzing neighborhood investment strategy is around the 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 number of vacant and underutilized properties that the city and the county have at their disposal that community sees as an asset and want to reactivate for their use and towards a purpose of wealth building in community. And so how do we unlock those properties in a way to do that? So there's the tax scavenger sale, there's the annual tax scale. How do we, you know, provide the resources? Is that, ta is there some tax forgiveness? Is there a, a pot of money? I do think, you know, the, the American Rescue Plan dollars do provide a significant amount of flexibility to the county to invest uh, in, in something like this. And I, the city is using some of its dollars for, um, for the, their community wealth um, building opportunity. So it is something the county can consider. Is there some catalyzing dollars that they can, they can allocate? And that's at a, 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 a greater scale than we would have to deploy immediately on this. So right. really you. thinking about that. Thank you, thank you, Morgan. Um, so uh, we're gonna move on to the balance of our festivities here and we invite our uh, guests who, whose contributions today have been invaluable, and we're deeply grateful to both of you to stick around and listen in if you have the time and the inclination. Uh, but I, I do want to move on to ensure that we cover the rest of our agenda. Now, um, I'm going to call upon uh, Commissioner Freeman uh, to give an, a report on the working group that uh, she and Commissioner Raymer have uh, have uh, very graciously agreed to lead. So, uh, Commissioner Freeman, if you would like to fill us in on where where you are, and I know you've had some meetings since last month, and that would be very very helpful, and uh, we can flesh that out then. Oh, absolutely. Um, thank you. Thank you. Um... Thank you, Chicago Community Trust, for your presentation. It's extremely timely. Um, and I appreciate the diligence that you guys have done around the community investment vehicles, particularly around engaging, um, engaging communities around development. So the city has Invest Southwest going on, Chicago Prize is going on, but there often is not a real vehicle for populations who are living in communities to reap the upside of the revitalization and potentially of what will eventually be gentrification. So um, I did have my hand raised. So before I go into my report, I did wanna kind of say, I would be interested for the county to provide money. For me, this is really more than a policy ask. It is really a cut the check ask um, and diverting those resources in such a way to allow residents and localized developers who have been in communities and providing sweat equity and you know, I sit in conversations and tables and the first thing they ask as a developer is what's your equity? Well, if I have lived in an underserved neighborhood, I've been putting in equity for the last 15 years by not having a grocery store I can shop at, by having inadequate education, by really not having trees and green grass and amenities that I can walk to. So at a point where there is an opportunity for folks to participate in a process, particularly because they have a certain level of subject matter expertise, this is really an opportunity to catalyze that with real dollars. So I did wanna throw that out there. Um, moving into the report, um, Chicago Community Loan Fund, who I think is on the call, but they are not on the Zoom end of it, I think they're watching live, um, has expressed some interest in joining the commission as well as the working group. So right now our working group has evolved from the initial members to also include a representative from the mayor's office, from the United Way, um, as well as a few other organizations. And so the conversations continue to be around what do these vehicles look like? Um, initially, we started out with evaluating the community investment trust model and then expanding it more to the community investment vehicle so that there are multiple options for communities to participate. Um, in these opportunities. And so we're meeting currently the Tuesday, the first Tuesday of every month. Uh, so if there is any other commissioners on the call who are interested in joining or at least having follow-up conversations, that would be great. Um, 
And Mark, if you or Wendy could give the, the report on what how the last meeting went, um, just because I was not able to stay on for that call. And I do know that conversation seemed to, I, I had it still going on, but I couldn't, I couldn't hear what was happening. So um, what, is there anything else that needs to be- and Commissioner up? Raymer, would you like to do that or shall I? Go for it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, so uh, the, the commission will recall that uh, our January meeting uh, 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 was uh, occupied in large measure with uh, the Community Investment Trust and, uh, and John Haynes uh, from Mercy Corps did make a presentation and is seeking to work with the county on that effort. Uh, he in fact has had some conversations uh, with Dr. Gale and some others at the trust, as well as many other people, uh, it's going to be loan fund, David Feinberg and others. Um, and um, in as much as um, the presentation today from the trust um, was intended really to broaden our appreciation of the opportunities here, uh, we concluded that the working group, which had been known as the um, as the uh, Community Investment Trust Working Group is now going to be the Community Investment Vehicle Working Group. And uh, so as to allow us, uh, you know, the, the greatest possible opportunity to add value and drive change. Uh, Commissioner Freeman, as you'll recall, uh, you were uh, advancing the notion that we should be um, exploring the establishment of an investment fund uh, which might be used for various community purposes around real estate development and the like. Uh, so uh, out of that last meeting, and this really will uh, resonate with uh, the commissioners who attended our last meeting, uh, we have now developed uh, resolutions that uh, I think it's probably timely to uh, present to the commission for its approval. And uh, I will read these resolutions to you uh, I think you'll find them non-controversial, and consequently, I think we can prove them by uh, voice vote, although I will invite any contributions for uh, edits uh, or expansions for that matter, but I, I will read this to you. It comes in the form of two companion resolutions. Uh, resolved that given the urgent plight of under-resourced communities within Cook County, the Cook County Commission on Social Innovation shall seek to catalyze interest among nonprofit organizations, foundations, and social enterprises in the collaborative development and implementation of a community investment fund and other community investment vehicles. So that's part one is really to uh, share, share the importance of uh, approaching this on a cooperative basis among the various necessary or desirable stakeholders to achieve mission here. And then the second, resolve further, that should a critical mass of buy-in emerge, the commission shall develop a proposal for the county board's consideration to dedicate appropriate county resources to help support such an initiative. So the idea is really to plant some seeds, see where uh, the greatest support lies within those actors who are likely to be most um, consequential as we move forward, uh, the trust clearly being one of those players. Um, so that's the res those are the two resolutions. And uh, I, I, you know, if anyone has any input, reaction, uh, I, I think we'd be thrilled to hear that. And uh, uh, is, is there such, uh, or, or questions or comments, I think this would be a good time to, uh, to consider them. Mark, it's Howard. I just have a quick question of uh, whether Commissioner Anaya has seen these resolutions. Yes, she has. Thank you. You're welcome. Anything else? Again, I don't think they're terribly uh, controversial. Uh, let me let me call a vote here, and again, voice votes. Uh, and uh, the whole idea is really for the working group initially. To, as it expands, and it will expand, uh, to uh, test the market here, initially the marketplace of ideas. 
And then to the extent a coalition can be created, an informal coalition, so it may be, uh, then come back to the commission uh, and see what it is we might reasonably seek to incubate with a view toward coming up with specific uh, actionable policies or even ordinances for the county board's consideration. So um, I will take these together as a consolidated resolution um, and uh, yay or nay will do it. Uh, so all those in favor, please say yay. 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 And yay. Any, any yay. opposed? Yay. Any, a little slower. Uh, any, any abstentions? I like that. I, I don't. I don't like abstention so much. Okay. So thank you. And th th we'll, we'll consider that kind of the initial marching orders for the working group. And what, what I do want to mention is to uh, we have two working groups today, and we will have others in the fullness of time. But as to the uh, working group that uh, Commissioner Freeman and Commissioner Raymer are currently leading. And Commissioner Brutus was very uh, generous with his time as well and some other folks over the course of the last month. Um, by no means are we limited to the intellectual firepower of the commission, as impressive as it is. Uh, if there are others who can contribute to this effort and are willing to do so, to whatever degree, we'd love to have them join the working group uh, to gain the benefit of their expertise and experience and institutional knowledge, as well as the platforms they themselves leverage. And that would be the case as to each of our, of our working groups. So um, is there anything more that uh, you wanted to say, Commissioner Freeman or Commissioner Raymer, for that matter, with respect to the working group? No, all are welcome. It's a real... Um, Moment in time here for the city of Chicago, yeah, my, you know, and if we can, yeah. My, my expectation know. is interest should broaden now, given that we were yeah. originally focusing on one specific strategy, uh, the trust with or without uh, Mercy Corps. And now we're kind of looking at the broader landscape uh, and different people may want to grab a hold of different pieces mm -hmm. of it. And that's perfectly fine. That's what this process invites. Um, I, I do want to also mention, we're kind of running out of time here, but uh, uh, Commissioner Aglipe and I have connected. Uh, she uh, chairs the working group that is to um, collaborate with the Obama Foundation uh, relative to scaling up its uh, methodology of, um, of um, expanding the talent pipeline uh, to diverse populations uh, that they are employing in connection with uh, the building of the Obama Presidential Center. And the idea is now uh, to kind of tell that story to the broader universe of employers, not only looking at um, not only looking at the construction trades, but potentially other uh, significant employers. And I just want to let you know that uh, we've had some conversations with, uh, the leadership uh, of the Obama Foundation uh, as recently as yesterday. And uh, they're assembling uh, significant materials for our use. Uh, they are uh, identifying a point person with whom we will be working initially on this project, although I've been told that beyond that, uh, others within the leadership of the foundation uh, want to get very actively involved in what we're doing. So uh, Commissioner Aglipe, you wanted to say something and I invite that, please. No, you're just you're just giving this a thumbs up. I'm just up. giving a thumbs up. I'm, well, gonna, we, I'm just giving a you. thumbs we, up we all, on that. We yeah, all but, appreciate that. Yeah, um, but you know, we all did say at the last one. If you have the um, working knowledge and lived experiences from workforce development, and feel that you have an interest in committing to these planning meetings, um, please let me know. I think everybody, uh, you know, we were supportive of it at our last meeting, but. Um, shoot me an email. I'll put my email in the chat uh, um, uh, about your interest and what you could bring to the table. Um, that would be extremely helpful. As I think, I think Mark and I were talking, but I'm like, you said basically everybody expressed interest, uh, but it was you know more or less support. But if you really are interested, like setting aside time, we are also cognizant of everybody's capacity, knowing also that the working groups that 
that are also ramping up from this, that would be great. Thank you. I should tell you though, it, it, as Jerry says that she has taken on enormous responsibilities with the SBA and she's just settling in yet at the same time is so generous with her time that she's willing to lead this effort. So thank you to, to Jerry again. I, I should also say there too, not only the commission, as important as the commission is to each of these uh, activities, uh, to the extent you're aware of other folks who might want to join in. And it, workforce development is the obvious uh, driver, but I think, you know, as we kind of look at the um, racial reckoning we've encountered, the, um, the social determinants of health during COVID, uh, uh, employers of all sizes are expanding what corporate social responsibility means. And, uh, and looking at social impact as a new form of currency and revisiting their uh, di uh, diversity, uh, equity, and inclusion criteria and objectives. Uh, so, I mean, there are a lot of different ways to look at what we're talking about here, but, to the, but from purely a self-interested point of view, to the extent that employers can expand the talent pool, uh, they're only gonna be better off and they're gonna be having better products, better services, uh, and their leadership will be emulated by others as well. So I think there are lots of ways to think about this initiative too. So any of you who are interested, please uh, let Jerry know. And if there are others that you know who might be willing to join that effort, um, strength in numbers. We, we need everybody who's willing to roll up shirt sleeves and work with us because these are you know, extraordinarily important uh, initiatives and uh, uh, as I like to say, uh, time is our enemy. Uh, so the sooner we can address these things effectively and impactfully, the better. So again, I, uh, I yeah, thank you, Sophie. Appreciate that as well. So uh, we um, Mark, have about just, 10 just minutes one left. Quick, oh, one I quick thing on the workforce. Um, if you're also interested, we know that we are for a job recovery. We're going to be majority minority workforce, but yet the more we can also get for those who are self-employed, also go into the workforce with the trades and the emerging vocations that are coming out. They will also grow their own businesses, be it micro or large, and they tend to hire diverse workers too. So Absolutely. I was looking at this from a lens of equity and diversity of how can we also spur that diverse workforce, not only from a labor lens, but from the workforce lens of ownership. Exactly right. And ownership is the way we bridge the divide. Um, so is there, any, I don't know if there are any further comments on any of those points. If so, let's entertain them. If not, is there any, uh, new business that has not come before the meeting? I should tell you, uh, each of the months in this year, I think you will probably agree. We've had some pretty exciting, uh, testimony and from that exciting testimony, uh, has derived very significant initiatives that are now in development. Uh, next month will be no different. And uh, the, the goal is to do that each and every month. And eventually we'll say, hey, we have enough on our platter and we have achieved success. Well, I don't know if we'll ever achieve success, but uh, there's a lot to do and no shortage of interest in doing it. So thanks to each and every one of you. If there is any new business, uh, this is the time to raise it. Yeah, this is um, Sochi Espinoza. I just, I'm just a quick question. I haven't been here in a couple of meetings. I just want to clarify or at least know um, we used to organize around committees. It sounds like those committees are no longer meeting. We are, and we are no, yeah, good question. Okay. We are no longer operating through a committee system, okay. but rather ad hoc working groups. I will explain to you what the reason is. Uh, the Open Meetings Act uh, imposes uh, its requirements on any formal committees, just as it would on, a, on a, the commission itself. Whereas by having ad hoc working groups, we uh, uh, do not need to comply with those, which allows us the luxury of having informal meetings between formal commission meetings without going through the notice requirements and having them all available to the public, which logistically, although I'm a great believer in transparency, would just be very difficult if we have two or three people trying to work together on a project to say, well, we can't do it Tuesday. We have to give notice. We have to post it. We have to. So here, the idea is really just in the interest of facilitating uh, 
outcomes in an accelerated basis. We've moved from formal committees to these ad hoc working groups. That's the explanation. Good question. Any other uh, business to come before the meeting? Mark, it's Howard. How are you? Okay. I, I just wanted to make a comment about this workforce development. Um, my current work takes me uh, to work with the University of Illinois system and the Discovery Partners Institute yeah. on tech education. Uh, part of it is upskilling, of course, of uh, particular segments of, of the county and the region in tech. But I would also emphasize that uh, this and this work is going to go long after the Obama, the OPC center is built in the fact that our state does not have enough uh, teachers certified in tech to teach things like CS, computer science. And one of the things that's got to start now, and we're working on it in the University of Illinois system, and I hope to bring them before this commission down the road with the county, is the uh, investment in the future of teaching the teachers, because you can't get students interested in tech without teachers um, in the schools. And literally, that's part of the solution long term. So I wanted to just mention, not of all things are going to be observable very quickly. Commissioner Mayles, thank you for that. And DPI is doing extraordinary work, um, as is uh, uh, Commissioner Malone's uh, group, in which I have a, a role representing two clients there. Uh, so, and that's another place that I think we see intersection of purpose. And I'd love to get those folks here too. So we will know everything in its time. Commissioner Bowen, I think you, uh, did you have a question? Are we happy to hear um, Something I just want to flag. I, I think it's really important that everyone, uh, we not slide past uh, a comment that was made today on the call um, from Janae and Ayana, and it's about impact ecosystems. And for those of you who maybe aren't as close to nonprofit work, um, it is extremely, extremely difficult to do equal, equitable development, which is what I would consider community investment vehicles without sustained funded, strong organizations that are scaled to institutions. It's extremely challenging. So there is no coalition of work where we just bring in a whole bunch of nonprofits that represent neighborhoods um, and like help and like help us, right? Cause like they can't afford to just do that. So it's important to be mindful about the barriers uh, that are in place for people to even be able to engage with our work as well as be able to scale to be institutions to support the impact we're talking about. And so without that institute, that scaling from small to mid-sized business or community org to institution, it's really difficult to do transformative, long-term sustainable change um, and long-term sustainable impact without that ecosystem that's funded. Thank you, Commissioner Malone. And I think today's presentation uh, was very, very productive in lots of different ways, not the least of which was in identifying clearly what those ingredients include. So thanks again to our Witnesses, thanks again to the commission. And I think we can entertain a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn, Howard. Second. You, Commissioner Mayer, Yonan. is there a second? Commissioner Yonan. So we stand adjourned until next month. Thanks to each and every one of you. Stay safe, stay healthy. Thank you. Thanks, Good night. Thank thanks, you. everybody. Good night. Good night. Good night.